Finals SAQ 72, Amniotic Fluid Embolism A. Amniotic fluid embolism is one of the four major direct causes of maternal mortality in the 2006-2008 report from the Center of Maternal and Child Enquiries, state the other three major causes. This includes genital tract sepsis, preeclampsia and eclampsia, and thromboembolism. Comments The confidential enquiries into maternal death are now run by the collaboration MBR-RACE UK. In the 2021 MBR-RACE UK report, AFE was shown to be the fifth direct cause of maternal mortality preceded by thromboembolism, hemorrhage, suicide, and pregnancy-related sepsis. B. How does AFE present clinically? From the highest to lowest incidence in order, hypotension, fetal distress, pulmonary edema or ARDS, cardiopulmonary arrest, cyanosis, coagulopathy, dyspnea, seizures, uterine atony, bronchospasm, transient hypertension, cough, headache, and chest pain. Arterial blood gases may show hypoxemia and acidosis. ECG may show sinus tachycardia, bradycardia, dysrhythmias, right ventricular strain, ST segment and T-wave changes. Echocardiography may show acute right ventricular failure, severe pulmonary hypertension, cavity obliterated left ventricle, and intracardiac thrombi or emboli. C. What are the differential diagnoses of AFE? Obstetric differentials includes eclampsia, uterine rupture, placental abruption, acute hemorrhage, peripartum cardiomyopathy, and uterine inversion. Non-obstetric differential diagnosis includes pulmonary embolism, air embolism, fat embolism, pulmonary edema, tension pneumothorax, heart failure, myocardial infarction, anaphylaxis, sepsis, aspiration, high spinal, LA toxicity, transfusion reaction, asthma exacerbation, and intracranial hemorrhage. D. Describe the two possible theories on the pathophysiology of AFE. The mechanical theory states that fetal tissue and or amniotic fluid forcibly entering maternal circulation leads to physical obstruction of the pulmonary circulation, leading to pulmonary vasospasm, cardiac failure, and hypoxemia. Entry of amniotic fluid containing fetal material into the maternal circulation may be via small tears in the lower uterine segment, endocervix, or site of placental implantation. The immune theory states that biochemical mediators in amniotic fluid trigger an anaphylactoid reaction. Amniotic fluid itself contains numerous immunologically active and prothrombotic substances, such as platelet activating factor, interleukins, complements, and TNF-alpha. Reduced concentrations of C3 and C4 in AFE, in conjunction with the presence of respiratory distress, makes it highly likely that complement has an important role in the pathophysiology. Activation of the coagulation cascade supports the immunological theory. It is likely that the pathophysiology of AFE involves a combination of both theories. Additional Q&A What's the incidence, mortality, and morbidity of AFE? Incidence of AFE is 5.5 per 100,000 pregnancies with a mean case fatality rate of 24.8%. In the last MBR-RACE UK report, AFE was shown to be the fifth direct cause of maternal mortality, preceded by thromboembolism, hemorrhage, suicide, and pregnancy-related sepsis. The long-term morbidity among survivors has been shown to improve because of early recognition, prompt initial management, and better critical care. Neonatal mortality has been reported to be as high as 40%, but in keeping with improved maternal outcomes, this might also decrease. It is still unknown if women who survived AFE are at increased risk of the condition in subsequent pregnancies. What are the risk factors of AFE? The risk factors of AFE includes induction of labour by any method, use of oxytocin for induction or augmentation of labour, assisted delivery, caesarean section, and other factors, such as maternal age more than 35 years, male fetus, multiple pregnancy, polyhydramnios, eclampsia, uterine rupture, cervical trauma, placenta previa, placental abruption, and ethnic minority. 
How is AFE diagnosed? The diagnosis of AFE is mainly clinical and is essentially a diagnosis by exclusion. The UK OSS diagnostic criteria for AFE states that in the absence of any other clear cause, the diagnosis of AFE is made by either acute maternal collapse with one of the following features, acute fetal compromise, cardiac arrest, cardiac arrhythmias, coagulopathy, hypotension, maternal hemorrhage, premonitory symptoms, seizures, and shortness of breath. Excluding women with maternal hemorrhage as the first presenting feature, in whom there was no evidence of early coagulopathy or cardiorespiratory compromise, or in women whom the diagnosis was made at post-mortem examination with the findings of fetal squamous or hair in the lungs. No lab tests are specific enough for making the diagnosis of AFE, but they can still aid and guide management. C3 and C4 have been found to be low in patients with AFE. The components of meconium and amniotic fluid such as zinc, coproporphyrin, and silyl TN antigen, have now been shown to have high sensitivity and specificity in small studies. Insulin-like growth factor binding protein 1 is a protein synthesized by the placental decidua, and its concentration is about 150 times higher in the amniotic fluid than in the maternal circulation. Its reliability as a confirmatory test is augmented by testing in conjunction with alpha-fetoprotein and fetofibronectin. Histological diagnosis of AFE is possible, however findings are not pathognomonic as they can occur in other settings. Fetal squamous and hair can be found in post-mortem histological samples from the lungs, kidneys, brain, liver and spleen. Resuscitation efforts may act to dilute the amount of fetal material in the mother and make detection more difficult at post-mortem. How is AFE managed? The treatment of AFE is supportive. Management depends on clinical presentation and whether the fetus is delivered or not. Senior clinicians must be involved in the management, including obstetrician, anesthetist, hematologist, intensivist, senior midwife, and neonatologist. An urgent decision to deliver may be needed and rapid critical care support should be mobilized. Management should always start with a systematic assessment as recommended by ARS guidelines. Airway and breathing. In mild cases, high flow oxygen delivered via non rebreathing mask may suffice. In more severe cases, oxygenation and ventilation should be achieved by early tracheal intubation, especially in labor due to increased risk of aspiration. In the initial resuscitation, ventilation should follow recommendations for lung protective therapy in intensive care. Cardiovascular. Cardiovascular instability should be managed with fluids, vasopressors, and inotropic agents. Usual first-line agents are alpha-adrenergic receptor agonists, such as phenylephrine, or mixed alpha and beta-adrenergic agonists, such as metaraminol, ephedrine, and adrenaline, given parenterally. Once central venous access has been secured, more potent agents such as noradrenaline, dobutamine, and murinone may be added as required. Early establishment of invasive monitoring, including cardiac output monitoring, is desirable. Echocardiography may aid in CVS assessment. In the case of cardiac arrest, resuscitation should occur as soon as recognized, following ALS guidelines. Displacement of the pregnant uterus must be maintained throughout. If maternal cardiac output does not return after two cycles of cardiac compressions, i.e. 4 minutes, perimortem evacuation of the uterus must be performed by the fifth minute to aid maternal resuscitation and improve survivability of the fetus. Intraaortic balloon counter pulsation, cardiopulmonary bypass, and extracorporeal membrane oxygenation have all been reported as therapeutic strategies in centers where they are easily available. Hemorrhage control. Uterine tone should be managed as usual with oxytocin, ergometrin, and prostaglandins. Bimanual uterine massage and uterine packing or intrauterine balloon often help in reducing blood loss. Hysterectomy should be performed as part of initial stabilization and should not be delayed if bleeding persists. There have been reports of uterine arterial embolization, but there may be insufficient time to organize such an intervention during major hemorrhage. Coagulation abnormalities should be corrected as soon as possible. 
hematological opinion and frequent monitoring of coagulation and point-of-care studies, such as thromboelastography, should guide further management. Options for treatment include fibrinogen concentrates or cryoprecipitate, antifibrinolytic agents such as tranosamic acid, and recombinant factor 7a. Follow local guidelines. These are my references. Thank you.